Or good afternoon. This is rooted for September 12th, and uh, we're looking at the church throughout this month, and we're beginning in Acts 9, and it's specifically about Paul's conversion. Now, we know that Paul had a great experience with seeing Jesus on the road to Damascus. Where's the road to Damascus? Well, here's the traditional thought of the road to Damascus. Um, here's Jerusalem down here, and it's uh, been theorized that he took this long journey all the way up to Damascus in Syria. And um, that's like 150 miles, and so that's quite a long journey uh, to be, you know, with a camel or walking or however they, they rode. But I'd like to postulate with you that the true road to Damascus might possibly be a much shorter distance from Jerusalem to Qumran. There's great evidence that uh, Qumran at the time of Christ was also known as Damascus. And um, so let's look at this just a little bit. It's common knowledge that a group of righteous and devout Jews fled the Roman influence in Jerusalem and settled in Qumran. They were called the Essenes, possibly the same people known as Zadokites, who were descended from Zadok, uh, Zeta, Zadik is a righteous person. The, the letter Zadik in Hebrew, it means righteous. And so uh, Zadok was a righteous priest during the reign of King David. Now these Essenes or Zadokites, they lived a communal life and hid the many scrolls from the invading Romans, which were discovered uh, in our lifetime, 1948, and known as the Dead Sea Scrolls. Paul had a three-year period after his dramatic conversion where he went into Arabia and came to Damascus before going to Jerusalem. It is very possible that Qumran at that time was also called Damascus and that Paul spent some time with the community there in Qumran as they were strong believers that Jesus, Yahushua, was the true Jewish Messiah. Galatians 1.15 says, But when God, who set me apart from my mother's womb and called me by his grace, was pleased to reveal his son in me so that I might preach him among the Gentiles, <clears throat> I did not rush to consult with flesh and blood, nor did I go up to Jerusalem to the apostles who came before me. It says right here, But I went into Arabia and later returned to Damascus. Now, Arabia is going to be that area of land that would be east of the Dead Sea, not up north in Syria. And he's, verse 18, only after three years did I go up to Jerusalem. So where was he for these three years? He said, uh, after three years, he went to Jerusalem to confer with, with Peter Cephas. And I stayed with him 15 days, but I saw none other of the other apostles except James, the Lord's brother. I assure you before God that what I'm writing to you is no lie. In verse 22, it says, later I went to the regions of Syria and Cilicia. So that's interesting. Back in verse 17, says he went into Arabia and later returned to Damascus. Verse 21, later I went to the regions of Syria. Is it possible that the Damascus he went to was actually Qumran and he spent some time with the strong believers there? Um, Damascus was far away and uh, it's not as likely that there were uh, these strong believers in Damascus, Syria, where Paul would have uh, gone and stayed and learned from them. But regardless of where the Damascus road was, Paul's journey there changed his life forever. Okay, I want to show you just a little short video about um, the people that God uses. I think part of this lesson is going to be that God can change anybody. 
and he may drastically change lives that didn't seem at all like they would be uh, the, the kind of people that God would use. Paul's reputation was that he was anti uh, Jesus and anti any of his followers, wanted to arrest and kill, and his reputation went before him. The people were, were very fearful of Paul, but yet this was the very man that God chose to use. But God can use you and I in many, many ways, ways that we didn't think possible ways that we didn't think we were qualified to be used so uh let me show you this video but we are in the army of the unqualified think god can't use you think he only uses perfectly qualified people take a closer look Moses was not a great speaker. Jonah ran from God. Jacob was a liar. Noah got drunk. Rahab was a prostitute. David had an affair. Jeremiah was depressed a lot. Solomon was rich in wisdom, but poor in lifestyle. John the Baptist was just plain poor. Timothy was too young. Abraham was too old. Lazarus was dead. Sarah was barren. Naomi was a widow. Gideon and Thomas both doubted, and so did Sarah. Peter lacked self-control. James and John were self-righteous. Paul had a short fuse. Well, so did Peter and Moses. Actually, lots of people did. God's army isn't perfect. It never has been. It's the march of the unqualified. Get in line. Ah, uh, yes. So true, isn't it great? All right. Now, let's talk about Paul. Well, is it Saul or Paul? You know, we see both of those names. Which is it? What's going on here? Born of a Jewish mother and a Roman father, his given Jewish name was Shaul. That's how you would say it in Hebrew, Shaul. That's where we get Saul. The book of Acts uses the name Saul from chapter 7 through chapter 13. But then in Acts 13, verse 9, it plainly states, but Saul, who was also known as Paul, there we see the first time in scripture that he is identified as Paul, also known as Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, fixed his gaze on him. Um, Paul is going to be more of the uh, Greek version of Shaul because he became the uh, missionary to the uh, to the Greeks, to the Gentiles, and so he adopted and accepted a Gentile-sounding name that would might remove any barrier than the name Shaul, which was a very Hebrew Jewish name. Saul or Shaul was the apostle's Hebrew given name. It means desired or asked for. Paul is of Latin origin, meaning little. Perhaps the Apostle Paul preferred to be called little out of humility of heart. He did refer to himself as the least of the apostles. 1 Corinthians 15, 9, he says, For I am the least of the apostles, unworthy to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. He got in line with that march of the unqualified. So let's get into Acts 9, uh, where it says, But Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues at Damascus, so that if he found any belonging to the way, men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. It was pretty ruthless. Paul had been indoctrinated to view the followers of the way as a movement that needed to be squashed out of existence. He was a Pharisee, 
and very zealous for what he was, uh, was taught was the will of God for the preservation of the Jewish people and their heritage. Remember, he's the one that witnessed the stoning of Stephen. They laid his, his, their coats at his feet. But what would make him take the persecution of believers on as a life calling, a compulsion, something he was so zealous and ruthless to do? We don't know the full answer to that. What drove him to have this? Uh, of course, he was trained as a Pharisee. He may have thought he was doing God's will, that uh, he was these people that claimed the Messiah had come, and he didn't believe that Jesus was the Messiah at all. And so he wanted to squash this, this movement that was being disruptive to the Jewish order. So here he is on the road to Damascus, and he sees a blinding light. Now, as he went on his way, he approached Damascus, and suddenly a light from heaven shone around him. And falling to the ground, he heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? God called him by his Hebrew name, Shaul, Shaul, why are you persecuting me? Now, of 19 verses in the Bible about Jesus being the light, 10 of them were written by John. And you see over and over again, things like this, John 9, 5, I am the light of the world. He is the light. And so it's no surprise that on this road to Damascus, this vision that he saw of Jesus was enveloped in massive light. Now, he would testify that he had seen the Lord. What way did he really see him with uh, physical features? Or was it just this embodiment of light? We don't know what exactly Paul saw, but he later testifies that he saw the Lord. And that's what set him uh, in the category of being um, an apostle. An apostle uh, was really, uh, in, in the beginning, defined as those who had a personal encounter with the living Lord Jesus. And that's why we too can be uh, said to be apostles of him if we have had an encounter. You may not have seen him in any physical manifestation, but you've seen the light is the point. And uh, he said, who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. He, there's the Aleph Tav, the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. Whatever way that he saw this bright light and he talked to Jesus and Jesus answered him. He said, I'm the one you're persecuting. You are persecuting me. But rise and enter the city and you will be told what, to, what you are to do. The men who were traveling with him stood speechless. They heard the voice, but they didn't see anyone. What did Saul see? in this light. Did they see the light that he saw? We don't know. Saul rose from the ground and although his eyes were opened, he saw nothing. He was blinded. So they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. And for three days, he was without sight. He was blind three days. And he fasted for those three days. He neither ate nor drank. He had a dramatic experience with Jesus and this was impacting him like nothing ever had in his life. Notice that to persecute his followers is to persecute him. To attack the sheep is to attack the shepherd. As he is one with the father, we become one with him. So great is his love for us. He is that personal of a savior to us. Now, like I said, he fasted for three days while he was blind. Can you think of anyone else that fasted for three days in the Bible? Who else did? Well, there are a few others. The people of Nineveh, when Jonah went there, actually Jonah fasted for three days in the belly of the whale, didn't eat. Queen Esther fasted as she called for uh, the people to fast as she was going to go approach the king about uh, seeking to spare the lives of all the Jewish people. Paul fasted for three days right here is where it says in his experience moving on to uh, verse 10, 10 11 12 now there was a disciple at damascus named ananias 
the Lord said to him in a vision, Ananias. And he said, Here I am, Lord. And the Lord said to him, Rise and go to the street called Straight, and at the house of Judas, look for a man of Tarsus named Saul, Shaul. For behold, he is praying, and he has seen in a vision a man named Ananias come in and lay his hands on him so that he might regain his sight. Interesting that uh, when the Lord called him by name, Ananias, uh, he said in Hebrew, Hineni. That's also what young Samuel said when he heard God calling his name. And he, he went to Eli and said, yes, Eli. And Eli said, I didn't call you. And this happened three times. And he finally he told uh, Samuel, when he calls your name, say Hineni. Say, here I am, Lord. This is such a, a, an important statement because that's what we need to say when he calls us, when he calls our name. You may not have heard him audibly call your name, but he has called you. He said, don't think that, that uh, you chose me. I chose you. He called you to follow him. And you may not have known the Hebrew, but what you said was, Hineni, here I am, Lord. But Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard from many about this man, how much evil he has done to your saints in Jerusalem. And here he has authority from the chief priest to bind all who call on your name. See, his reputation preceded him. Uh, was Ananias perhaps afraid? Maybe. He was just an, an ordinary man, but he had strong faith. <clears throat> and he said, uh, you know, this man was like, God, do you know who you're, who you're talking about? But the Lord said to him, go, for he is a chosen instrument of mine to carry my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. For I will show him how much he must suffer for the sake of my name. Ananias and the believers knew all about Paul. And they knew that the chief priests in Jerusalem had given him authority to arrest believers. But look, they did not run away or make preparation to fight with this man, Paul. They were forewarned that he's coming. They didn't get ready and, and uh, to, to fight him. They submitted to the Lord's will. So Ananias, verse 17, departed and entered the house. And laying his hands on him, he said, Brother Shaul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road by which you came, has sent me so that you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And immediately something like scales fell from his eyes, and he regained his sight. Then he rose and was baptized. And taking food, there he ended his fast, he was strengthened. For some days he was with the disciples at Damascus. This is another <clears throat> possible indication that these were these righteous uh, Zedekites that he stayed there and learned from. But it says that he rose and was baptized. It doesn't say that Ananias baptized him, does it? We don't know if he was baptized by another person. There is such a thing as a Jewish mikvah, which Paul Shaul would have known very much about. He would have participated in those. Uh, but it's when someone totally immerses himself in water, and it can be done privately. But it could very well have been a public baptism for the benefit of of others to see for themselves what a change had happened to Paul the persecutor. He became Paul the evangelist and uh, yet he was formerly Paul the persecutor. So I believe this baptism when it says he rose and was baptized and he did it in, in this order of belief and then baptism and that's what I believe baptism is the believers really first opportunity to witness for the Lord Jesus to say, I identify with Jesus. I'm buried with him. I'm dying to self. He rose from the dead. I'm rising up out of the water to a new life. Not that baptism saves you or does anything. It's a picture. But that's what happened with Paul. It doesn't say here that the baptism is what did anything to Paul. It, but he did it in obedience, and I believe he did it publicly to let everyone know that he had changed. He had been changed. 
And there again, the righteous believers in Qumran could have been used of the Father to teach Paul many things about his brand new walk with the Savior. And it says, and immediately he proclaimed Jesus in the synagogues. This is the drastic change that can happen to a person who is confronted head on by the king of the universe. He can do a miracle work to prove himself to be who he says he is. And what did Paul do when he had this dramatic, drastic change in conversion? His eyes were open and he was healed from blindness. He immediately needed to tell people and say, this is the truth. And he went right into the synagogues. Was he prepared to do that? He didn't say, um, let me go to seminary and learn how to preach before I do this. No, he went and told what he knew to be the truth. That's what we're to do. And he goes in the synagogues and says, he is the son of God. And all who heard him, they were amazed and said, is this not the man who made havoc in Jerusalem of those who called upon this, this name? And has he not come here for this purpose, to bring them bound before the chief priests? But Saul, Shaul, increased all the more in strength and confounded the Jews who lived in Damascus by proving that Jesus was the Christ. These people, they, they were amazed at the change, the drastic difference from this can't be the same man. Look what Jesus has done in this man's life. And this uh, passage reminded me of an article that uh, I've read in, in college from Group Magazine, and it was called My Boring Testimony. I never forgot it because I kind of identified with this. I remember back in college days, and you remember uh, testimonies like this when you know the Jesus movement was going on, and, and we would hear te testimonies of man, guys that had been in jail, um, you know, doing drugs, selling drugs, uh, partying, drinking, doing all kind of things, and, and yet they got saved, and their their lives were totally transformed, <coughs> totally turned around. It was just like such a drastic difference, and and we were kind of mesmerized by hearing all the the horrible stuff that they did because we we weren't familiar with doing all that kind of stuff, and so. Our testimony just, hey, my testimony seems kind of boring because I didn't do all those kind of things. You don't have to have done all those things to have a great testimony. Your testimony is not boring. You were changed just as much drastically. Maybe it, your, your life change occurred over a longer period of time. But God chose you for his purposes to make your life a living testimony. You know, this uh, this idea here of uh, having a boring testimony in someone who had a drastic change. It reminded me of this parable, um, well, uh, in Luke 7, where Jesus said they were, there was a money lender who loaned uh, money to two guys. One of them, he loaned 500 denarii, and one he loaned 50. And he goes to uh, collect his money, and neither one of them were able to repay him. But he forgave both of them their debt. And he asked Simon, which one then will love him more? And he said, I suppose the one who was forgiven more. And Jesus said, you've judged correctly. And I guess that's what I, I think of maybe someone who there's it's so in, in the front of their mind and their experience in their life of look what all I've done. He could never forgive me for what I've done. I I've owe him so much. And that person might love him more than someone that says, well, okay, you know, I've been a pretty good guy and, you know, but I walked the aisle and, and I got saved. And yeah, I love Jesus. So this is where I think the longer you are saved, you can be kind of like what, what is said when Paul said, I'm the chief among sinners. The more he looked at his life, the things he, he realized that he was a very, very sinful person. You and I need to come to that is what I'm saying, that your testimony may seem boring of not coming out of a, a lifestyle of, of drugs and drinking and, and sin and, and breaking the law and, and all that. But truly, we're just as much a sinner. We need to realize that we have, we're just like the one that owes the 500 denarii. 
It's not that we, oh, I've only done 50 denarii worth of sins, Lord. No, I've done just as many sins. My heart is just as wicked. You know, we've got to come to that point and um, realize that your testimony is not born. You were drastically changed the same way. Let me show you a video testimony of uh, just such a, a, a an individual whose life was drastically changed, who had a sordid past, um, but God dr dramatically changed this this man. And I don't, I can't remember his name right now, but uh, just listen to this example, and it'll, it'll touch your heart. September of, of 2008, I went to jail for trafficking methamphetamines and manufacturing methamphetamines. I went in front of the judge and um, he sentenced me to 15 years for the trafficking and 15 years for the manufacturing, but he ran them concurrent where there would be one 15 year sentence. But I became a gang member, an intravenous drug user, all within the first you know, two or three years of, of that prison bid. And everything changed. I, I fought the guards. I would fight rival gang members. Yeah, my mindset was I had been dealt this life. Let's just, let's just get it, let's just go. I could care less how I treated you. I could care less how I treated anything that you cared about. All I cared about was my brothers that I, that I banged with or my homeboys that I scored dope with. But the one thing though that affected me was, um, was, you know, knowing that I didn't, my family was just, um, I didn't have any relationship with my father at the time, and and I had really put my mother through hell. I was this this professional baseball talent athlete that had professional um, capabilities, and here I am, a gang member, a, a drug addict, a drug user, someone who has no value on life. I couldn't think like that because it was it was not reality for me anymore that I thought. That life, the life that I had been handed to me, baseball, a uh, family, I destroyed it. I had burned every bridge imaginable. And so I would just put a needle in my arm and get high again and it would go away. Late October, mid to late October, I got invited by one of the guys that I'd met on the prison yard playing basketball with. He, he invited me to a, a, a chapel service. And I, I go in there and I, I hear the message and. And it wasn't one particular thing about the message that made me want to get saved. But I, I did go back to my dorm and I, I told the guy, hey man, thanks for inviting me, I enjoyed it. And he was really zealous, you know, he was saved and he was really about the Lord and, hey man, you'll come tomorrow. And I was like, yeah, man, I'll come back tomorrow. But the one thing that I did do that, that night when I was on my rack was I picked up the Bible. So for two weeks, um, I just read the Bible and I went to the chapel. The Holy Spirit was was beginning to to minister to, to me and, and soften my heart through the Word of God. At Easterling, they show movies Wednesday morning at 10 o'clock. You can go into the chapel service and watch a movie. And I walk in and, they're, and on the screen, they're playing uh, The Passion of Christ. I remember right then in that moment watching Jesus, uh, you know, <laughs> say things like, um, you know, Father, forgive them, they don't know what they do. And I remember thinking he's, he's, he was talking about me. You know, I remember him standing there and uh, they want to give over, it's either him or, or Barabbas, you know, and I remember watching this movie and thinking, dude, the whole my life, you know what I'm saying, you did that. All my life, you did that for me and I had, I had no knowledge of it. You know, I didn't know that. Here I am, a, I, don't, I don't care about life. And, and I remember making the decision right there, like, I don't even know what's happening. I was crying like I am now, but it was really more intense. And I remember asking Jesus, like, if you, uh, if this is you that's doing this, you know, and, and you had me crying, I hadn't cried in years. I hadn't cried in years. And I remember thinking, if this is you, then please don't stop. You know, because I don't have the power to, I don't even know if you're real, but I, I, I want to give my life to you. And if, if that's even how you do it, you know, I don't know the protocol of a salvation prayer. I've never heard a salvation prayer. I didn't know the Romans road. I didn't know none of that. It was me and Jesus and me and the Holy Spirit right there. And, and I remember saying, I give my life to you. And, and from that day forward, that was, that was late October, early November of 2012. And I remember I just, I fully submitted my life in that moment on that chapel 
church pew in that, in that level four prison institution. I submitted my life to Jesus and, and I made a deal with him. You know, I'll serve you. You know, if you'll change, if, you, if you'll help change my life. Last month was my five year of being out of prison. It's my sixth year of being saved. I got married, like I said, to my high school sweetheart. We have a ministry house in Columbus, um, and we minister to the homeless, we minister to prostitutes, we minister to drug addicts and gang members, and it's just what we do. Wow, isn't, isn't that powerful? I love testimonies like that. A powerful testimony. But like I said, your testimony is not boring. Jesus changed you from from what perhaps could have been that kind of a road of those things. But nevertheless, our hearts are all deceitfully wicked, and we all need the salvation of the Lord. If you want to share your testimony, this is how um, it really can be laid out for all of us. What was my life like before I met Christ? Attitudes and actions toward life in general. What was your self-image? Who do you feel was in control of your life? Do you think you would go to heaven? Did you think you would go to heaven when you died? Now, I'm asking this question um, even uh, of myself as a child. I can answer these questions. Attitudes and actions toward life in general was well, just to play and have fun. My self-image, well, you know, I guess I thought I was a pretty good person. Um, but yet, I felt like Jesus was outside of my life. I didn't feel like Jesus was in control of my life. I didn't know if I'd go to heaven when I died. That's why I went and woke my dad up out of bed and said, I can't sleep. I think it's Jesus. So how I realized my need for Christ. How did the Father get your attention? Who influenced you? Were you impacted with the truth by someone, something you read or watched? Like that man uh, watched the Passion of the Christ. Did the Holy Spirit bring conviction to your heart? See, um, God got hold of, got my attention. I remember my dad was preaching on that uh, Revelation 3:20. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I'll come into him. Uh, he influenced me. I would say that my dad was the, the greatest influence upon me uh, coming to know Christ. And how I received or met Christ. Is there a time and place you can recall when you prayed for Jesus to save you? Did you know how to pray or was it more of a cry to him out of desperation? You know, I, I can look back and say, well, I don't know the exact date. And I think it was a Saturday night, but it was in my home there in Dayton, Ohio, in the kitchen. And I asked Jesus to save me. Now, there may be people that say, you know what, I just don't know that I've got a exact memory of his act when seems like I've, I've i've known jesus you know all my life <clears throat> and and i'm not discounting that um but sometimes people that battle doubts with their salvation that uh, the doubts can be erased by just settling it and nailing it down uh, to know that there was a time and place that you asked jesus to save you and uh, there might be somebody listening to this that would say, hey, I, I, I think I need to just go ahead and nail that down uh, and do that right now. Um, and that's up to you. If, however, the Holy Spirit calls you and draws you. But then there's that fourth part in your testimony. My life since receiving Christ. What changed in your life from the direction you were going before you gave your heart to him? What difference did the indwelling of his Holy Spirit make in your life? Do you live with confidence of eternal life in heaven? All these things are part of your, your testimony. You know, if you share your testimony, it's really more about this number four than talking about number one. Sometimes you've heard, you know, just like even in that video we just saw, someone can share all, they can go on for 45, 50 minutes of their life before they met Christ. And then just maybe talk a minute about how, uh, and then I got saved. You can tell by that the testimony of that uh, young man. Yeah, his life was pretty sordid, uh, but how much he wanted to talk about what his life was like now, and um, you know the ministry that is involved in, and that's really I think your testimony is what is Jesus Christ doing for you right now. I want to leave you with a, a song by Calvin Hunt. He uh, 
died in 2009, uh, born in 1957, um, and uh, I think he died of cancer. But he was uh, a young man that was in uh, under the ministry of the Brooklyn Tab in New York, and he became a, a very well-known singer. Uh, and this is his testimony, uh, kind of interspersed with him singing this song, I've been clean, I am clean. So uh, let this song minister to you, and I'll see you next time. Make it a little bit personal for me. Tell me what, it ha what happened to you. How did crack influence your life? Well, actually it destroyed my life. It didn't influence me at all. I, uh... I got involved with it, mm -hmm. got hooked on it. It became everything to me. I would, uh, I would come to this place here, park my car down this street here, mm -hmm. and I would stay there days, days, fill my pocket up with, with vials of crack and go into these bushes and stoop down low and just smoke crack and just waste, waste myself away. Cleansing blood that flows from Calvary, and in this blood there's a saving power for it was. I've seen a lot of hurt, a lot of pain. I've seen mothers give their children up for men to sleep with. And it was all in the name of this drug. I've heard that it has a voice. I mean, did you ever hear a voice coming from crack? It will call you. It will call you. That's true. Yes. It, um, there was a time I stopped smoking crack for almost six months. And we were doing fine. And just all of a sudden, I got up and I went out without even thinking. I went right to the crack house. That's when my um, nightmare really began, because then I had to start fighting for my husband. How'd you, you fight for him? Well, God brought me to um, a lot of prayer. I began to, I learned how to fast. I began to just call on the name of the Lord. And she prayed, Lord. Don't even let him get high off it. Let him let them let it, the money be a waste. And I felt I felt that. She didn't leave him. No, didn't she prayed for him. him. Just hung in there, even though for days he would be gone and it would became very difficult. But she just made a covenant with God, with you, nothing is impossible. He, the seed's been planted in him, but now God, you've got to visit him. Holy his blood. His cleansing. Can wash away my sin. Who oh, I stand today with my heart so clean through the blood that Jesus shed. I am truly. This is it. Yeah? What went on here? This is where I brought it, smoked it. Back here where this building is. People used to wait a half a block long to get their crack, waiting for their turn to get to the door. Back behind the building is a doghouse. I used to sleep and stay in that doghouse, watching over another guy. I used to sell drugs there. I can't understand how I ended up here. I never hoped to, I didn't mean to, but I ended up here having a home, having a family, 
having a nice, beautiful apartment. I was sleeping in the doghouse. So one night we did go to the prayer meeting, my children and I, and Calvin had been away like four days from the home. And I went home, and my wife and children weren't there. They were at a prayer meeting, and I laid down to sleep, and I couldn't sleep. And I heard God's voice calling me. I was compelled to get on the train and go to the church. And when I walked in, all I heard was Calvin. Lord, save him. Lord, bring him. Lord, draw him to this building. And I walked in on that. He happened to walk straight down the aisle where a bride would walk. And he just fell to the knees. And the pastor said, and here he is. I had run for so long. And now I was, I was, I was tired of running. And I began to cry, God, please make me clean.